Good afternoon, Richard Miller here, and this is Never Not Here. Uh, welcome, please be welcome, and we're, we're having an open mic, one of our open mic series, so uh, please help me welcome Daniel Hertz. So thanks for coming on. Hi, Richard. Thanks for, for doing uh, Never Not Here. I've been there several times, watched great conversations from you with several people, so wanted to chime in when you gave it uh, an opportunity. Yeah, actually the opportunity is always open and uh, thanks so much for coming on board. Uh, you know, people write me also about my questioning and they write me about, uh, you know, some people love the show and love the way I question and some people are not so sure about it. <laughs> and so maybe I thought I'd make a few clarifications. But cool. um, to me, uh, uh, one problem with so-called non-duality is that we're saying that the languaging part of humanity is not that much tied to this moment or it's without a thought and an idea, uh, many things that we speak about and concentrate on or give our attention to. Um, are not really here anywhere. I mean, they're just so much in our thoughts and in our interpretations, and somehow we can look at things as if they embodied that interpretation. And uh, so we're saying that uh, basically the thought part is not real, and there's a way to just be in the presence, and then we just be in reality. And, and for me, uh, what happens because of that is that... Uh, Nobody really tries to refine their words very much. And uh, these details just get shrugged off. And, and uh, I think that words are important because I think that uh, actually our, our, what should I call it, our hypnosis or our, <laughs> our conditioning is all langu language based. And so then if we just ignore all those words, the conditioning just uh, goes merrily on its way. <laughs> and uh, so then I kind of think that um, the details can be important. Yeah, well, I would agree with that. I, um, I go with this. I say, uh, in the moment we talk, we talk. And there's something we cannot talk about. And you can put a lot of different things into that. Uh, let's start in the typical non-dual um, context you would say the silence how can you talk about silence the moment you talk you're not silent anymore so you know um or in the philosophical sense uh, that uh that, that there's always that we don't know that we don't even know so uh, all we do in talking is we're approaching reality and so we want to get closer and closer to it knowingly that we always will fail and I think that's a, a humble position that I prefer. And being 53 now, I prefer people who are talking that kind of come from, from a kind of humble position like that. That doesn't mean that I'm not listening to the others. But I, I kind of get tired of this idea that some know and some don't. Um, just simply because our existence and what we the place we're living in even from our interpretations you know what you just said even even the interpreted space of our existence so what we know as to be the universe or our earth and and, and this amazing place we're living in uh, even with words uh, you can be a total awe at it <laughs> it is so incredibly deep and the more we look at it, the more sophisticated tools we develop with language to look into it scientifically, philosophically, uh, politically, economically. The deeper we look into it, the more miraculous it gets. That's at least what I see and what what I, you know, perceive in my world. So this it's this huge space. Of, of wonderment and, and, and to some degree for me, for sure, excitement about having the chance to be, even be here. And one way you said uh, get closer and closer to reality, even though you know you're going to fail, but well, maybe you could turn it around and just say, okay, I'm going to get farther and farther away from conditioning, even, and I, you know, I'm going to have some successes because I'm going to leave a lot of my 
old thought patterns behind. And maybe yeah. that clear space is, is kind of a ripe place for uh, yeah. just uh, being okay with yourself, which is already a big step ahead. Well, see, that not that sort of um, what I hear so much from everybody of this non-dual teaching world? that in the end, uh, many of the questions come down to, am I okay with what is? If I can be fully okay and open my awareness completely, make it really, really big, include everything, my past, my future, my nowness, uh, the thoughts that I have, the feelings I have in my body, the inconsistency that I see in the world, all of that, I can brace it all and I don't say any of that is excluded. Any, any of that doesn't, it's not allowed to be here. In the moment something magical happens, um, uh, something relaxes, something becomes at peace. Um, and uh, for me, from my experience, my day-to-day -day experience, when I do that, I get touched with something. Something touches me, and I have a hard time wording that. I could call it God, I could call it silence, I could call it emptiness. I, you know, I don't really care what you call it. But it's certainly there is a touch. And I notice, like even saying that with you here in this space, that I sense it here right right between us. That there is this when you touch. say when you say okay, you know, okay with what is. Well right. that's kinda of like a precondition because many people are saying, Well, if you could only just embrace everything, accept everything. And right. you can't really do that unless you're really kind of, and somehow come to terms and say, I'm okay with it. And right. maybe that takes a kind of a story because you could say, well, I always used to hate that, but I guess it's right. a step in the path or something like that. And then just leave it there, you know, and, and somehow not care if it, it shows up because it's here, you know, and then. It's here, yeah. Yeah. And then in a way, something you said, uh, miraculous kind of happens, this, this peace and rest comes and. I think that, um, to me, I'm, I've been taking that as kind of like a mechanism that when we don't really have a belief that something's needed, that we're needy, that we're lacking, you know, in other words, that's the same thing as saying we're okay with what is here. You know, right. we might have a preference or something when we're okay with what's here. Well, then our obedient servant called uh, thoughts, thought structures, uh, kind of like uh, fold up shop for a second, you know, and yeah. just say, well, I guess I'm not needed. <laughs> this guy's okay. <laughs> and so then that's what, uh, you know, that seems to be a, a mechanism almost. Yeah. Um, and, and I would go this far to say, um, you know, who says that we always have to be good? Who says that I cannot be okay with not being okay? I have a number of things in my life right now. I have body sensations that I'm not really happy with. You know, I told you earlier today I woke up sick, you know. And so, yeah, my ideal state would be not to have any pains and aches and not to be a little sick. Or my ideal would be that everything in the world is okay. But who says that it has to be that way? Who says that there is a particular goal for this existence and once that accomplished, then now we're all okay? Or the whole idea that enlightenment, you know, in some moment I will attain that enlightenment that will, you know, encompasses all states uh, through all sleep and dream states. I'm always aware and now I'm completely and finally there. Okay, so, but that's an imaginary standard. And once the seeker gets a hold of that imaginary standard, now we're seeking after that. It's, it's a, to me, a loser's game. Because here's, here's one thing that I, I really am moral at so ever since I came upon it. And that is, you know, when I looked sort of the backward step, how they say in Zen, I looked into the source, where's my hunger coming from? Where's that seeking coming from? Where are my tendency coming from? And so on. I realized they were always there. I had, I can't remember a time where they weren't there. I can't remember, and maybe that that is a state where some people go, that you have a state where you see through all lives and all your lifetimes, maybe I'm just not there. But my conclusion simply was, hey, what do I have to do with those things that come through through me? What do I even have to do with my body? 
I didn't really pick all of this. And, and so therefore, it's just there. It wants to come through me. It wants to happen. And, and so the best game I can play is to just go with it. You know, what, what's wrong with that? It just is there, including the miserable parts and the parts. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, except that we, you know, we just have to uh, realize that that's an option because, uh, you know, in all our, our schooling and in all our co we've been coached to say that we should alter things and kind of uh, um, change things for the better and, and apply ourselves and, uh, and, you know, we never thought that, oh, you could just be who you are and, and then somehow you would be in a natural, well, I don't even want, I don't really necessarily want to say a natural growth, but I mean some kind of a evolution or some kind of a, a change is happening. I mean, because let, let me ask you this, because you said uh, these things were always there, but have they changed over the decades? Well, Tendencies um, and stuff like that? Yeah, sure. I mean... Um, things that were of great interest to me, uh, I don't know, a few years ago, don't interest me anymore. But I didn't know how that happened. I didn't know how I lost interest in it. It just happened. So, um, well, one thing you could say about interest, you know, like you're all, you're often interested in things that you don't quite have yet, and that you think you could get. I'm right. not really interested in being the president of the United States because I don't really want it, or I mean, uh, I don't think I could get it. Right. But I mean, uh, and and things that I already have, you know, I might be interested in holding it. But I mean, I'm not so much interested like I was when I was just almost there. And right. so, as things kind of some somehow uh, manifest, then you know, I think the tendency is to lose interest. Yeah, and. I noticed that it's in direct relationship to how much I've opened myself to actually what is. Uh, the self-reflected, um, sort of as a child, you know, I, I, I have a couple of kids, they're now adults, and I remember what situation with my, my son, he was like totally in this world. I, he, he thought this has to be this way now. And a friend of mine came, stormed into his room, a very, very passionate, good friend of ours, and, and so sort of hit him here on the, on, the, uh, on the front head and said, you know what, there's a bigger world out there than your little world. And, and it hit him. It, it really arrived uh, at his heart because it came with great intensity. And, and in one moment to another, this whole idea that certain thing had to be for him this way, sort of poof, went this way, because he opened up and saw that there's more, much, much more. And... And to me, oftentimes, the spiritual seeking is just the same thing. It's like, I want, I want, I need this, I, you know, uh, how is that any di from, different from, from, from anything else? I remember this, you know, I had several, it started in my childhood, um, I had several experiences where I, ca I cannot better describe it than where it sort of disappeared, where everything else sort of, the, I was still seeing everything, but that which I saw was just as much me than what I felt inside here. It just happened spontaneously, then it happens a few times through drugs, and then of course I always wanted it back. I wanted that feeling, this amazing feeling of where I always could only find one word for it, and that's kind of oneness, you know, be one with everything, that this, this separation disappeared. So I wanted to repeat the experience. That's like a really cool thing you're going after, right? I mean, once you've touched that, hey, now you want it all the time. And maybe there's this amazing state where it never goes away, right? Now you're finally fully enlightened and you never lose it anymore. And over time, and I was almost a painful process, I realized that I lost the desire for it. That I got tired of looking for it. I, I just, it sort of dropped away from me, this whole desire to be in that state. And it was like a departing of a, of a sweet thing, you know, it was so close to my heart. I need to be, you know, I have that search and then I will teach it to others and we're all going to be at one with each other. And then, then that disappeared. Well, of course, if you, when you talk about the, the part with drugs, uh, it usually gets worse and worse, right? Because you got to take right. more and more drugs, and then, and yeah. you have to take bigger and bigger hits, and then, 
and then there's bigger and bigger side effects and then so then yeah. you can certainly get fed up with that now you might also just get fed up with uh, some natural experiences because they just don't come you know and then you say well here i've just kind of devoted to 10 years of my life to uh, recreating this thing, but it's not really happening, you know? And right. so then uh, maybe I should just get out with life, get married, have a family or do something else, you know? Or... Yeah, no, I mean, this was happening while I was married. I'm, we, my wife and I just celebrated yesterday 32 years of being together. You know? Congratulations. Yeah, and, and see, to me, um, what I experienced over and over again in my journey toward oneness, uh, you know, to living oneness. That's that's sort of my the direction. You know, the question that I want to ask now that I'm here is where am I going? Right. I mean, that's sort of the question. Now oh, that I'm present, let's just assume that. You know, we have we have a baseline. We're here. Okay. So where are we taking this? Then the question that shows up for me is how do I manifest? that which I've seen over and over again in so many different forms, not just as an inner experience, but as uh, observed it in others, observed it in relationships, lived it in relationships, you know, to, to a great degree. Um, so how do I, how do I make this manifest? You know, how, how can I, how can I, you know, I guess, you know, a lot of people call that embodiment or the bodhicitta, you know, the, the way where you really share that enlightenment with, with all beings that you go out there and, and, and become one, not just inside of yourself, but with everything that occurs in your world. Maybe it's not such a big deal. Maybe you can simplify it and just say, well, maybe I'll just start accepting people as they are. You know, exactly. because even when you're enlightened, you think, oh, my wife should be more enlightened. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not really doesn't ease off of anything. You know, you actually get harder at it. <laughs> well, so, I mean, that's that's awesome what you're saying, because uh, now that I've accepted everything inside of me, right? We were, we were talked just about that. I'm OK, right? I, I got I became OK, not just with what works for me, but also with the stuff that doesn't work become okay with when I don't do what I expect for myself and when I do what I expect for myself. I mean, you know, you can play that game further and further, but then the interesting thing becomes, can I do this for others? Absolutely. How, did, how is that working out? That to, me, that's, that to me is where it gets hot. That's where I, I feel like, man, now... Now we're starting to talk, to talk you know, that, that's the conversation that is, that is really exciting to me. We were you talking know. the other day, you know, and, and uh, yeah. I was, you know, sometimes uh, many teachers talk about tendencies, like the whole right. world is waking up, right? right. And so I was kind of having, having to say that, you know, it seemed like uh, people are more accepting. And I've been in some, I don't really have any kids, but I did go, get myself involved with a couple of schools. Or university right. this uh, this winter, and then I just saw that people were living in a in a, in a beautiful diversity, and uh, also just kind of functioning very well together. And instead yeah. of putting it on as a tendency and try to foresee that the world is improving or something, I said, "Well, what about if that uh, the world is a reflection of me, and I'm just accepting mm -hmm. people more and more, and so therefore I recognize it in others, and uh, maybe that's how it, it could work, just by." Uh, you see in others what you recognize and accept in yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, how, how can we look really further beyond our own filters and perceptions? So, I mean, one, one of the ways to, to get that done is to try to find a philosoph philosophical or some other framework that allows you to, to look with a little broader spectrum so that you're not like locked into one way of looking and open that, open it up a little bit more. Um, like, for example, I like uh, Don Beck's and Ken Wilber, Cal, you know, Claire W. Grace and, you know, what's his name, John Gebser, the, these philosophers and psychologists that found a spiral dynamics, the value systems and humanity stage development, as Ken Wilber is calling it. Well, that's very cool. You know, now you can look at people and understand what they're dealing with in the stage developments there. I know, of course, I don't want to come from an arrogant, arrogant point of view and, and, and look, oh, yeah, I understand. And, and, you know, these people need this and these people need that. But it's a tool 
almost like a toolbox tool for empathy, for more empathic relationships. In a way, you know, but I mean, I was just suggesting turn that around and just say that, okay, it's really not them that's doing anything, it's me. I'm going through a stage, so then I recognize that people are uh, more awake than I thought they were. Yeah. It's just a reflection of me, all those stages. Yeah, could be. Yeah, and you don't have to really have a philosophical underpinning to say, well, there is, it really is all oneness, so that it has to be a reflection of me, it's actually me, you know? But I mean, that's just all very, very abstract. It's yeah. very abstract, and, and I mean, is it helpful? Yeah, is it helpful? That's, pure, that's well, so well spoken. I don't think it's helpful. I actually think it's damaging, mm -hmm. you know, to, to build a lot of end games and try to see uh, the whole pattern and see the whole... Okay, let me share this, you know. Uh, um, just uh, It's almost the same subject. Maybe it's shifting gears a little bit. But I've just sure. been reading a little bit about uh, atomic physics and about uh, uh, the quantum and then right. how they developed that and over the First World War, kind of like from the from actually the turn of the century, maybe I'm up to 1926 or something now. But anyhow, uh, a thing that they got stuck in so badly all the time is every time they looked in there, they wanted to create a model of how an atom worked and how the, how the electron shells worked and stuff like that. And what are these energy jumps that is a quantum, you know, as electrons can jump, why can they only jump in a certain place uh, from one energy van to another and why can't they go continuously and how does that work but as they were trying to um, develop this quantum mechanics and how it works they were trying to explain it with Newtonian mechanics mm -hmm. and they were saying th you know and they couldn't let go of their old paradigm of how to visualize the world and so then they were saying for uh, they had to get more degrees of freedom to explain certain things that they could observe, like spectral lines and splitting of spectral lines and stuff like that. And they need, and they couldn't mathematically uh, duplicate th those kind of predicted results or those observed results until they got more degrees of freedom. So there was up and down, left and right, and back and forth. That's three. They needed a force, so they called it spin. You know, and so then spin is just a word that means there's two degrees of freedom, a right or a left, you know, but it's not really a spin like a top, you know, it's just a quantum, it's not Newtonian, mm -hmm. you know, and so then uh, they were trying to visualize it and saying, well, spin is impossible because if electrodes going at a speed of light, then if it was spinning, the outside of the spin of the electron would be going faster than the speed of light, and that's not possible. And so then they were mixing metaphors, in other words, they were stuck in their visualization, you know, until, and finally some, some of the guys just said, look, we can't visualize this, you know, there's no way that it, we can visualize it as, as we see a planet, uh, you know, a sun with planets going around it, it would be like an atom with electrons going around, it's not that way, you know, it's a whole different paradigm, and that's what we're doing, uh, I think, in all, most of the pointing, you know, about non-duality. We're trying to visualize from our kind of mental manifestation and our picture of the world how this thing works. We're mixing these metaphors and we're not really coming from somehow we have to drop all the, all the tendency or the desire to visualize and just go to presence and uh, forget what it looks like or you know what is it you know try to mock it up and uh, I wonder if that could be a metaphor for non-duality or if that's just something in the physical realm. Well, it brings me back to something we talked about earlier, that we're approaching what we're looking at, that we come closer and closer to seeing, to fully clearly seeing or something like that, or to, to, uh, to this um, interplay of observation and manifestation. But you know, I, I call that we always will fail at it. Um, you can call it any way you want. For me, this is a, a wonderful thing. It just simply means that we live in, in an infinitely deep uh, universe that has infinitely an infinite amount of riddles and playgrounds for us. And we're using more and more sophisticated models, including a in more and more sophisticated language, to not only see it, but then also from the seeing to create manifestations, to create actions, to create social behavior, to create, you know, interaction between each other. 
and 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 so a stage of uh, consciousness yes of course it's something that i have to develop otherwise i cannot even use those glasses but once i have the glasses to look at that this way then maybe i can be helpful because ultimately when i contacted you is for me uh, there's, there's a few uh, themes that go through everything we talk about that, that sort of we're still in that container. We can't get out of it. One of them is economy. Uh, the economy of our days. Economy means, of course, more than just exchanging money. Economy is how, how do we exchange anything and everything in the way we live with each other. And and so that's a container we even now, you know, if I wouldn't pay for my internet access, we couldn't talk here. Right? Or if I would have physically visit you, I got to drive over there or fly over there and I gotta pay for that. So economy has become sort of like a meta um structure, you know, a meta macro uh conversation in which almost everything that we talk about nowadays uh falls under. Uh, and it, it it has not been that way. It certainly is not the truth for for many indigenous cultures and maybe some other cultures that just don't relate to it that way. But certainly we here in the U.S. and in Europe, where I'm from, everything is is through and through connected with that, including teachers who teach non-duality and charge for it and sell their books. And why do they have to do that? Because well, we call it, we got to make a living. And what does that all mean? What does that mean in, in relationship to non-dual awareness? You know, I mean, in some way you could say, in the moment we're really fully non-dualistic, looking at the world at oneness, why do we struggle? Why do we compete? What, what are we doing? If we see non-dually and, and we feel non-dual, we have a heart of oneness, of wholeness, which is, of course, an amazing I mean, just a wonderful thing that it happens on a larger scale and not just a handful of people, but it seems like more and more people have this sense of oneness. You know? So if we have that, I mean, the natural next step is to say uh, not to inflict any pain on each other, not to compete against each other, not to uh, try to, you know, uh, you know, get ahead uh, over somebody else and then to say, oh, you know, too bad. Uh, you just slipped off the economic scale. I'm sorry, you know, but, you know, that's just the way it is. That doesn't make any sense in the world of oneness. So, what you know, I'm... you said something about uh, have a sense of oneness, but I guess that could be all over the map, you know, from uh, totally some kind of a real emerging into spaciousness or some kind of just sense of connectedness, you know, where connected has to be two, right, so that they're connected or somehow... And right. inclusiveness, maybe just start from an inclusiveness that somehow you're my brother, you know, that I, yeah. I include you. Yeah, why would, otherwise, why would, I mean, we, we can agree on one thing. Oh, if we look long enough into the nature of our being, we realize that at the core is something that's just present and it's not manifested. It's not, it's not engaged in any kind of way. It's just there. And it, it it spans through everything, the manifested and the unmanifested. That's that seemed to be you know one of the ways you can say it. And it doesn't matter who I'm listening to, in one way or another, they're saying that. Okay, so all right, so we come we're coming to that realization. Now, why would we have that realization? What's the purpose of it? Well, even without a purpose, why would we have it? Let's just stop it there. Yeah. And ask why that would question. We have it? Why would we have it? It just happens, right? I mean, it, I mean, we, we didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with us individually or even collectively. Or maybe somehow uh, relaxation uh, was the key. Somehow yeah. we relaxed or accepted or just, uh, uh, you know, let's say that we allowed our attention to open, whereas usually it's focused on earning the book yeah, or, yeah. you know, keeping yeah. the grind going or fixing the car or you know, our next right. task, and then our, our awareness seems to be single file, you know. And so, you know, the precursor to uh, allowing more could be that we don't have to do all those things. I mean, the, uh, we don't, like we said, we're accepting whatever's happening or somehow we're off of that treadmill just a little bit. And so then that wideness, that widening of our intention allows us, just uh, makes uh, this experience happen. 
Right. So here's, here's an interesting other question to look at that's directly related to it. So we're doing that for ourselves, okay? So I'm sitting there, I'm meditating, or whatever way you want to call that. And I allow everything, I rest, I relax deeply, and what comes over me is this sense of oneness. Now, when I tell you, Richard, um, I, make, I want to make oneness personal. I take it out of the impersonal realm. I don't understand this whole thing with impersonal enlightenment. I, I think enlightenment by nature is impersonal um, because it has nothing to do with me, with my body, with, with, with anything. It's just there. Right? I mean, so but I can make it personal. I can make that oneness personal. I have an ability to, to do that. And that's a language thing, by the way. Say, can, say more about that. How, how, what do you mean by I can make it personal? I can go to you and I can say, Richard Miller, I don't know you in person yet. I would love to. Like, uh, you know, I love people. And I love people who ask good questions and engage in exciting uh, conversations. And as you made a step, you became visible. And so I can find you. Awesome. Wonderful. So now that I found you, I say, my conclusion for my non-dual realization is, that I say, you are my brother. I love you. I, I, I hold you in the same space of oneness than I hold myself. And here's is something I, I want to check that with you. See what you think. Well, I mean, let me say this. You're allowing it in the door, but it doesn't Oops. necessarily mean that it's still personal. Uh, maybe it's not you loving me, you know. And maybe it's not me being loved, you know. It's just... Uh, <laughs> You know, it could be that, you know, it, I don't have to, I don't oh. think you have to define it one way or another, whether it's personal or impersonal. Well, but the thing about personal is that I say I want to define it. I actually embrace the part of me that is manifested. Well, in a way, you're just saying, uh, let it act out through, through, my, through my mechanism, my body-mind, let it act out. And so then right. that's the personal part of it. For me, you become real. Right. We're, not only we're not real. We're not real to each other because we're still engaged in our inner conversations that we don't make other people ever real. They become sort of you use other people to find yourself. But here's the thing I wanted to uh, check with you. See, there's a great confusion around oneness. If I want to be one with you, I got to drop my, you know, my separate, my, my, my individual, individual self and you know, I got to surrender, so to speak, to the bigger one, right? That, that... No, we're, we're making a judgment that we're, we're using each other just to find ourselves. And uh, we're somehow uh, engaging in our ideas uh, when we see each other. And so then part of our attention is filtered through our ideas, and part of our attention is actually... Uh, given in generosity to you to each other and maybe that's uh, only a small part I don't know you know but I mean what can we do about that that's just the way it is um well we can we can do certainly do something about that I, I think and then and part of that is uh, it's a new understanding I like what you said early in our call you said you believe that language is important right right I do I think it's underwater so, and, and kind of controlling us, you know, with our with our belief structures. Yeah, absolutely. So we, if we can find cool language, that can be very, very helpful. Especially considering that any of uh, a non-dual experience of oneness is always something that has to be interpreted, right? I mean, you can have... People go to, uh, um, you know, a Christian church and they have an experience of oneness. And for them, that's God. Uh, that's the God that they're praying to. And uh, if you're a Buddhist and, you're not, and, uh, and you have that non-dual experience, well, it does a, because it's silent, because it's not manifested, any way you talk about it will be an interpretation of the, uh, from the cultural background that you find yourself in. Or it'll be something that you come up with. That, that, that you creatively uh, generate just because you want to sort of maybe push the envelope, maybe find a different way to talk about it, you know, and, and, and here's one way I suggest. So if oneness is really there, then there can only be one oneness, right? Right. Can be only one oneness, and that's, you know, that's kind of abstract, but, 
here is sort of the other side of that story. And that is everything is unique and certainly everybody is unique. So oneness has only one way to manifest itself in this world, and that is through uniqueness. Everything is only once. You know, a friend of mine said uh, earlier, he shared an experience, he's a magician, very, very good one. And, and they do borderline stuff. Of course, it's all kind of smoke and mirrors and tricks, but they still have to uh, embrace it emotionally and, and really put the magic to it. So one of his teachers said, okay, go to this uh, riverbed and find me two rocks that are identical. And a whole big group of people went out there and they couldn't find, not one of them could find two rocks that are absolutely identical. Now I've asked a lot of people about this after, do you believe that there's anybody exactly like you in this ocean of 7 billion people? Let's say, just say it's 7 billion people. Yeah, well, no, I don't. And I've not met even kids, old people, very educated, not educated, non-dual awareness or not. Everybody gives me the same answer, which is no. I cannot imagine that there's anybody exactly like me. You could go into studies of twins, you know, and just uh, maybe that would be the closest you could get and just realize, no, they're quite different. They're quite different. So I, if I go a step further, I say there is nothing alike. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to me, woo, that's exciting. That is an amazing uh, realization when you go the next step with it. Because what it means is that this oneness in its uniqueness, when it manifests, it needs the other to experience its uniqueness. Because if I, if that would be just you and me, our uniqueness wouldn't mean much, right? But if you have 7 billion others, actually our uniqueness is a, a lot more sophisticated. So the more humans there are, the more significant becomes our uniqueness. And that's sort of really turning everything upside down. Because in general, people feel like, oh, the more people there are, the least, the, the least um, you know, it, it doesn't matter that I exist, you know, oh, there's many people, you know, and I, I'm nobody. Well, it's the opposite in the world of oneness. In separation, when we use each other, uh, to define ourselves in the way of separation, then that's true. Then you don't want to have the, all this many others because otherwise, you know, what does that mean? You know, you have a very limited bandwidth of defining yourself. You just always right have... in separation. In other words, uh, the right. more there are, the more insignificant you are. Right. But in oneness, the more you are, the more there are. Perhaps uh, the more important you are. I don't know. You are unique, like you said. And the more exchange you have. In other words, every time you embrace another unique human being and you really, and that's what I was getting at when I said, I declare my oneness with you personally. And the moment I do that, and the moment I deeply engage with you, with you as a person, with the conversations, with your good and your bad, with the good, bad and ugly, with, with all of it. And the moment I do that, something unlocks in me. Because now we're dancing together. Now I got not only anger at my wife, which I've been dancing with for 32 years. I got my kids to dance with. I got my friends to dance with. And now I got Richard Miller to dance with. And I mean this a particular dance because I have no chance to dance with humanity. It's far too many people. I can't even meet even, even a small fraction of them. But you are that human body in your uniqueness in my life. And so one of the things that I believe we're missing all the time is the opportunity that every human being brings to us when we meet them. We, we, like, we have objectified human beings to such a degree that we're, that, that, you know, we, we treat each other, okay, for as long as you're useful, I keep you. But when, when you fuck up, when you mess up, when you do something, you know, I, I get rid of you because, you know, you, you, you did something that gives me no reason to get rid of you. But in the world of oneness, that doesn't make any sense. You're not here randomly. You're here out of all these people out there. You're part of my life. You're part of my body. You're part of my existence. So if every time I say I get rid of you, I get rid of a part of me. And that brings me to economics, <laughs> you know? <laughs> 
because if we leave uh, now, um, Oxfam said that um, now it's really literally we have a billion people hungry, not just in food scarcity, but they're hungry. They they have no food. A billion people, and these are our fellow brothers. This is my body. This is a cell of mine, hungry. Now I'm not coming from see. And this is the, the great contribution of non-dual dualness in my life. I always had a tendency to be sort of a lefty and uh, and be be very engaged with social questions. But non-duality have has given me a place to come from that's not uh, like I'm alarmed and you know we got to do something otherwise the world is going to go to shit and so on. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, that's not the right place to come from because... No, I love what you're saying. You're totally, to you know, I'm on the same beam as you, you know. I, maybe I'm less active than you, but I'm trying to get no, involved. Yeah. But I think that somehow that anxiety-based call to action has got to go. Yeah, it, it, and it, it, it causes also, um, um, for the most part, enemy images, right? You know, you, you, you figure out who it is that you need to go against, and that doesn't work. I mean, we have... That's another thing that separation has... Uh, you know, or, or, or that understanding our existence is so beautiful about, you know. So that's where our I great mean, confusion is, you know. When we think of right. going for something, we think of uh, it's equal to going against something. And that's <laughs> that's totally, totally opposite. It's totally the opposite. Yeah. But going for something is for us still almost like a miracle or, or a mystery. It's, it's totally very rare. Different. It's very rare, actually, you know. Because usually what we're going for is a concept. And what we're going away from or against is a reality, like we're going away from this moment, you know, and my life in this moment, is, I'm a lump of coal and I'm, I hate it and I want right. to get out of here or I got a, uh, an uneasy feeling and I want to get away, you know. And so then we right. say, I, I even think going for enlightenment is really just so conceptual because the story we tell of this freedom called enlightenment is what's giving us this yearning power as far as I'm concerned. People want right. to make it, deify it and make it holy and say it's, uh, right. the yearning is something, a gift from God or something like that. But maybe it's a useful way to uh, explain a, a, a stupid tool, but anyhow. Oh, but this, here's another question for you, Richard. If it's all about oneness and if that oneness is the core of our existence, which I am present to, uh, to various degrees, if that's so that if one of us get present to that, then that must be in everybody of us. Right. Where does it come from? We can't just invent it. It's got to no, be some, it's not something that, real. So I have to get there if you already gotten there. I asked Adya Shanti that question. I said, if I embracing you, if I, don't, if I stop my separation with you completely, I accept you as a teacher, as a person, as what you, what you are completely, right? So that oneness that you are is then in me. It's complete. There's nowhere to go anymore. But to each other. Because, you see, the foreness can only be for you. you know, I like, I, I, supposedly Ramana Maharishi said, uh, there is no world, there's only Brahman. But then he said, Brahman is the world. So what he was saying is, see, a lot of the dual, non-dual teachers get stuck at the absolute view and say, well, you know, the world is illusion and, you know, the only real thing is the unmanifested and so on and so forth. I mean, there's even this guy who wrote the book, The Haunted Universe, you know. I mean, he, yeah, takes, I I mean, I mean, he takes it all the way to the nth degree. There is even nobody here that's looking at anything. This is, this is an empty universe. It has no purpose. It doesn't go anywhere. That's the truth. Well, yeah, that is true. That's the one side of the truth. The other side of the truth is our passion for life. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know if that's the truth, you know. I think it's just, you know what I think it is? It's like I was talking about uh, science and quantum. It's like a right. Cartesian view of emptiness. When you yeah. have a Cartesian view of emptiness, it's, all, it's just totally futile, you know. But yeah. get out of that Cartesian view and it's totally full. Hey, I mean, we can argue it until the cows come home. Is it all one or is it not? And uh, then the next question I have to simply ask, so, so what, why do you want to argue that? You know, in the end, uh, you need to make a decision about that. And that no, is... I don't think you do. Forget the oneness, you know. That's an overlay. 
just forget all that stuff. You know, okay, you have experiences, you don't have experiences, you feel right. close, you feel far. I mean, that's what this moment is all about. And so many people, you know, instead of trying to have a, a grand scheme of things, which it always has to be overlaid, you know, laid on some, some experiential groundwork, just uh, meet what's here. You know, yeah. that's the other side of it is meeting, meeting, meeting the moment, just meeting yeah, well, it. And, and if you bring it into the moment, it's just the same story. Right? I mean, it's only this one moment. Yeah. It's always, it doesn't matter. You can't get away from it. Who knows? Even if you're dead or commit suicide or anything, uh, who knows if you ever get away from it? Where, what other moment would you be in? <laughs> I, I mean, exactly. <laughs> So that's what I mean with oneness. I mean, I don't want to use it as an overlay. Uh, I just, it's just it. It's just a way to talk, you know, but yeah. anyhow. You know, and it's the conversation of the day, you know, because the separation conversation doesn't take us anywhere anymore. A really good conversation I had, a really good one, you know. But he kept saying again and again about the human situation is a belief in separation. But what good is that? What good does that do to anyone uh, to know that I'm believing in separation? And, to, and there's no way I can put, apply myself and start not believing in separation or believing in unity or believing that there are no boundaries. Or any way I look at it, I'm trying to cart use the Cartesian, you know, an old kind of a, a system of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of sensing objects. And I'm trying to model that into something that, that it isn't. And uh, it can never work. And uh, so then I don't see any use to that. Just to say one more thing, uh, sure. he said like uh, the ego is attracted like a fly to a, uh, like a moth to a flame, right? Trying to know this, this, this truth, this empty space, right? But yet when it reaches out to touch the flame, it, ha it, it dies in the flame. But I'm saying that's, that's a really uh, backwards way to sp uh, speak, and uh, it's kind of useless. In other words, uh, as long as there's uh, uh, coming from this Cartesian point of view, there is no flame. And, uh, you know, the, uh, so then it's only when there's a relaxation and, and, and uh, there's a kind of a, a space allowed that uh, a flame is, is there, a flame of the truth. So it's really not a, there's no ego to die, there's no ego to be afraid. There is uh, no ego to resist uh, getting close to the flame. I mean, the flame doesn't even exist until until that moment when uh, when relaxation occurs. Right. You can create a whole lot of ideas that you then have to overcome, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> that's how it sounds to me a little bit, you know. Exactly. That's, that's when I brought up Florian, who said, well, what do we got? We got awareness, we got attention, we got this moment. <laughs> That's it. Is there anything else you want to bring into this? And I think you can't argue with that. That's that's it. And when the intention gets really narrow, the narrower it gets, the more distance you create, the more separation you get, because you're not embracing the full picture anymore. And the moment you're embracing the full picture and you really open up your awareness, something relaxes, and we talked about that before, something touches you that just is there, you know, and, and we can talk about it, forever what it is it is the divine over light that shines through all existence and all time and yeah okay i'm settled with that you know and i, I say this with confidence because you know uh, one of the things i've done for 30 years of plus is uh, work with breath with people breath is a very interesting little phenomenon because you know, in order for us to think and speak and do anything, we have to breathe. And that was the first thing we had to do when we came here. We had to uh, learn to breathe, and everything else happens after that. So it's a very simple phenomenon. The moment you focus on your breath in a very natural way, there's no technique involved here, you sort of unfolding your consciousness, and you come very easily down to uh, a sense of oneness and relaxation and so on. It works like a dream. It has worked in all cultures. I've done it for Indians, for Europeans, for Dutch people, for Americans. It works every time. It's always the same process. I have hardly changed it over the years. I developed it you know, in the 80s or so. It's a very simple thing. And then when you look into Sufi work or you look into you know, all kinds of different other traditions, it's always the same thing. It's all very simple. You know, it has to do with music, which I also like, and so I don't, I don't want to go too deep into that. 
all I'm really saying is I believe that the non-dual state is very easy to get for people if they don't create all kinds of ideas about how difficult it is and how much they have to break or be broken some negative patterns inside of them or anything like that. In reality, none of that has to do with it. In my, uh, my experience, it has nothing to do with uh, getting rid of anything. It has more to do with getting in touch, uh, relaxing enough so that you're touched, that something can touch you where we're normally a little too busy for. The moment that happens, you get a sense of it and, and your whole life gets that touch. Wouldn't it be wise even to just get rid and talk about not getting rid of anything? But one thing we could get rid of is the is the label, the non-dual right. state, the non-dual yeah. state, and we could just right. call it something like, uh, you know, your life is really effective when you're just a little bit relaxed and and not so, and, you know, because we've been taught many times to apply ourselves and to really push hard on some things right. that we want the most. And uh, uh, let's just say that that's an old model, and and we've done it a lot, a lot, and a long time. And maybe we should try right. it the other way for a while. Well, and then there's the historical context. You know, I I grew up in Europe. Uh, the Catholic Church is uh, pretty much all over the place, and maybe other churches, but this is like the by far the biggest organization. And what I learned about that church, uh, what this church did over the last two thousand years. Um, plays very nicely into an agenda of folk, people focusing on themselves, right? I mean, you you should pray and pray to God and live a great life and maybe have a chance to sit beside God, beside God when you die. Uh, and, uh, you know, do that. Purify yourself, work on yourself, do da 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 That sounds to me like modern non-dual teachers, and that sounds to me like the secret where they want to create uh, this great reality with their minds. It's all focusing this way. And why? Because the church needs one thing, if we get together in the marketplaces and we organize, <laughs> that game is not that easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, here we are with another case of an old paradigm and really trying to use that uh, in, in to discover a new model. And right. uh, all we are doing is just uh, living in the old paradigm and putting a new label on it, you know, a new shingle up on our store, but it's still selling the same it's junk, you know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, this whole idea of self-improvement um, is in so far flawed because, for me, because what we are as each and every human being is such a miracle to begin with. Nothing that we can improve in this system can ever get to the, to the beauty of what already is here. I mean, you can work all your life, you can be Mozart and all that, and, and great Last night we saw something about this uh, conductor Levine. I mean, this guy, unbelievable what, what he can do. But, you know, his story was is a story of a, na of a person who had such a natural feeling for music that he never did anything else. With 10 years, he was already so brilliant that everybody looked at him. And, and he has ears, and, and, and you can see an envy to some degree, a life of somebody who's naturally just himself all his life. Because that's what just pours out of him every moment, every moment of his life, right? And so this inspires me for all the people who may not be that gifted, but are still unique human beings. Yeah, well, forget the gift part and just concentrate right. on what you were saying is a magical phrase, like just naturally so much himself. Right. You know? And then that's it. And then all gifts flow from that, right? Because all striving gifts. to be someone else, uh, you're denying all the gifts. Mm -hmm. And so then if you want to have a gift or two, forget about the gifts and just naturally be yourself. Right. And so here's, here's what I believe I see more and more and more. And that's something that I'm sort of testing more and more in my thinking and in my actions. I don't believe that to be naturally yourself is a self-reflective engagement. To be naturally yourself needs community. Now, I'm not saying this as um, a, a statement of, oh, that's how it is. But that occurs to me more and more. Yeah, that's very beautiful. You know? I mean, uh, one step in that is to make yourself visible, right? Yeah. One step is, is to make yourself visible and to, to bring this back and to make others real. 
like to say you're real and and go beyond this impersonal BS. Everything is impersonal. Yeah, it is impersonal. Of course it is impersonal. Let's just forget about all of that and get engaged with each other and 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 recognize who we have. Like because it, it's, it's, it doesn't look to me like we have like, oh, an endless supply of human beings that, you know, and the ones that are not useful just die away and then, you know, we get some others to choose from. That's not really how it works. I see, you know, one of, one of the biggest ep 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 epidemic epidemic in the U.S. is loneliness. Old age loneliness, people not having others. Why? Because maybe because we have passed them on all our lives and said, oh, yeah, you're not the one, you're not the one, you're not well, the not one. Well, not only that, the... we've said, I'm not the one. And so then we haven't I... made ourselves visible, right? There's right. both that. You're not good enough. And then the other side is I'm not good enough, so I can't come out yet. Right. And, and very much like your open forum here, you know, I want to take advantage of it because I, I think it's totally time to come out. And, 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 and for me, coming out means I am here with, with my imperfections, with, with everything that I got, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm here to help your uniqueness your unique gift that you are to emerge because every time I can help it, something in me turns on. And, that, that, and, and that, that's not a theoretical game. This is not a construct. This is totally real. Yeah, but I mean, even let it be a game, you know, let it be a game and let it be a theory and oh, just yeah. say, okay, the theory in the game is that uh, uh, oneness is only realized through, through uh, uniqueness and in the, uh, in the, individual uniqueness let, let it right. be and, and uniqueness can only really flourish and and come into existence when it's in community because it has to ha has to reflect itself in something else what is, what does that un uniqueness mean if you have nobody right no that's so perfect like we talk all the time about the sangha and about the reflection and about transmission and about re uh, some kind of a reflection or some kind of a tuning fork uh, phenomena and stuff. But, I mean, that's all happens in, in uh, multiplicity. It doesn't happen uh, in aloneness. It happens in multiplicity. And I, I, for one, I don't even believe in transmission. No, I don't, I don't like that word, but we say it a lot. You know, I don't like the word transmission meaning something's going to go from left and cross the screen and go over to the right uh, right yeah <laughs> but i mean the well, only only thing what happens is if you're in the presence of somebody who doesn't have an agenda doesn't have like a goal something to go to something accomplish something an expectation an expectation or there's only presence of that person you flow more yeah you're just free and you because... interpret you interpret that flowing sensation as something that comes from the other person but i don't think that's the case I think, you know, I've been in the presence of the Dalai Lama, a really sweet man, you know, and what I felt like, he's open. I can be there. He's not having me placed in some particular spot. He lets my unique presence that I am just happen. He, he, he welcomes it. In other and words, so, he doesn't pin it, pigeonhole you. In other words, he has no yeah. categories. In other words, he's not, yeah. uh, he respects you totally. In other words, you're... I, when he's facing you, you're the most important uh, being on the, on the planet because that's what's here now. Exactly. So then we start flowing because our systems are flow systems, time, space generating systems for the purpose of experience. And they want to flow. They, they, they feel better the more flow happens. Yeah, I really get that, you know, because like I was thinking the other day, uh, it just was coming to me like, why is this moment always changing? And I thought, well, if it didn't, if it wasn't always changing, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even show up on the radar. We wouldn't even be here yeah. because we wouldn't realize the flow, there would be no, the flow would be stopped. And the flow is what, uh, what is consciousness is the flow probably without the flow, there's no consciousness. I mean, everything is just frozen in the river and moving together and everything, right. everywhere you look, it looks the same. And, yeah. uh, and so then there's nothing to see. Nothing to see. Yeah. So when, when, when we don't, so in, in, in a dual game, we're always losing. 
losing in the sense of what we try to overcome, we become. What we try to overcome defines us because we're putting all our attention there. And in a dual game, the one who is more brutal and more, you know, is better at that game will win. Right? So in other words, if you are coming from a, a peaceful, all-inclusive, holistic kind of view, and you fight the ones that are not coming from that, you will lose. And I believe we're always lost. Throughout history, the voice of connection, the voice of, of oneness, has lost for good reason. To come finally to the point to say, okay, how do we play a not dual game? How do we play? And, and I'm not meaning, I'm not saying, you know. Well, wait a second. Let me say a few comments, because like you said, right. uh, people that play a dual game win. But what do they win? They win World War Four. Yeah. You know, that's all they it's win. Pretty, pretty, pretty. And you're just saying the ones that don't play the dual game don't win. But I mean, I don't think anyone's playing because finally they just say, okay, I better be a dualist. You know, I better fight the, the evil forces or something like that. Maybe nobody's playing. Well, the, the very nobody, few, very few. Yeah, very few are playing. That's right. So there, there is a game of engagement with each other that sets forth more flow. You know, when you when you get shocked, when you when you when you are in a violent environment, I mean, uh, flow is the opposite of what you experience. You contract, you get hard. You know, if you that's what I'm saying. You know, uh, to, to true unique uh, 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 flourishing and, and and thriving happens in community. Why? Because when that community is is not pigeonholing, uh, pigeonholed or whatever each other, call, each other, you know, and actually says, "Wow, what are you? What miracle are you? Let me let me get that right." Yeah, Doesn't matter. be whatever you be that miracle. Be, be that miracle. No, no, not yet, not yet. Hold on a sec. Uh, I can't go that fast, you know. I'll be it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Right. So when that happens, all systems start flow more. Start to flow more. So in other words, in in the, in the play in place of a dualistic conflict-driven evolution, we can engage in an engaged uh, evolution with each other, where we uh, in place of conflict we put uniqueness. I know that's like like a big jump, but you know people say to me all the time, I I've got a peace project, and so people say you know they say all kinds of things about peace that don't make any sense to me. One of them is uh, peace starts within yourself. Yeah, okay, yeah, fine. Um, what I have to say then is, will you let me know when you're there? And uh, will you know when you're there? I don't understand that. The other thing to say is, well, there's never going to be peace because, uh, you know, there's peace and then there's war and the two always will be. Then I have to ask him, well, well but you, what, what do you want? You want that to be so? No, they say, no, 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 I would like to have peace. Okay, <laughs> simple. <laughs> like, you know, we're always in this in this conceptual trying to understand things. Why can't we go with the heart and the needs and the feelings that are really present in our midst, right? And uh, my theory is that loving each other in that degree, making oneness personal, is just really an adventure. It's very, very powerful. We, we just go, woo -hoo! <laughs> you know, whoa, that's a little too much for me already. <laughs> right on. Say more about peace starts within us or not. Well, peace to me, uh, and for that matter, love, is better expressed in a relationship. I can observe that better when people have that with each other than when somebody has it inside of themselves. Peace as an individual is in some way meaningless to me. Peace is a social term. Peace means that we are engaged with each other in such a way that that is, is, is life supporting. It's helpful. Well, you know, peace can be a series of agreements and saying, you know, uh, uh, I'll follow the law if you follow the law, and, and that's some kind of a peace. But I mean, I think the peace that uh, uh, that would reflect in all in all your actions and in all your relationships would be uh, not an interpretation. You know, no. it's not another story. 
No. And so then, in that sense, it is a uh, a place or a no place that that does start within you. It's like a place that doesn't have a story, and uh, yeah. it's uh, it's everywhere so it's actually. Huh? Uh, you said you got to show up. So uh, if it's in within you and it's there, then all it needs to do is got to show up. Well, I mean, as you show up, and would that's what's that's what shows up. And that's the you that shows up. Right. You know, is that kind of like, well, I don't have to say no story, but it's like uh, it's not really emphasizing any story over another. Your story is just as good as mine. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's peaceful. That's peaceful, absolutely. Uh, at the core, again, is that I accept you and see you as a part of me that really doesn't completely, you know, but, but here's, here's the danger of that. Um, when in my conversations with people, they say, wow, if you, I make you part of me. That means I always got to listen to you and I always got to include you and everything. Oh, my God, we can't ever any, get anything done. And, <laughs> you, know, and uh, you know, all this. Well, yeah, but tell me any better game. Tell me any better game than be engaged with each other and support each other's uniquenesses and, and the manifestation of it. Now, when you combine that with the realization that we're approaching reality, that we're approaching, uh, you know, how we manifest everything here, you know, um, then, then, then we have an internal game to play. A beautiful, amazing opportunity to to manifest that uniqueness that's that's really a hold and silence, and that pours out like the, the eternal cookie dough constantly changes, constantly brings up. And if I am there to receive it and to allow it to happen, and we are that in a community, then we create a field of oneness that's manifested. And, and, and that's the only thing that I can see in terms of activism for our days today. Now, the more form we can big bring to it, the better. In other words, if we can do it local economies, local food, uh, all that local stuff, if we can build global networks that become financially powerful, why not? We have, we have, we have an economy in place that we can use any which way we want to. Why is it that we're such wimps? Why is it that the war boys can hog it all? Well, I, wait a second. Now, I'm not, now we're going into the economy, which was something that you were really interested in speaking about. But um, I'm not so sure that we can use the economy as it is now any way we want to. So yes, let's we, say, say more about that, and I'll tell you my well, angle on it. Well, there is, there is certain economical truth out there, right? Uh, in other words, the system is shaped uh, for, for the interest of a handful of people, more or less. And, and if, they, if you know how to play the system right, you have a huge advantage over anybody else, especially if you have any cash to begin with. But what you also have to have to play the system right and, and take advantage of is is a callous attitude. Well, I think that the system is a callous attitude. Right. The system is, is it, and, and it's the only thing that it'll work with, actually. It's like a me attitude. Not necessarily callous, but it's me first. It's me first and all no. that. But it doesn't mean, because it's based in numbers, it's not based in any kind of philosophy. Yes, yes, the constant growth, and so it needs a lot of adjustments and everything. But we still have a marketplace. No, it's that... based on a lot of different uh, parameters that are fixed, you know. First of all, yeah. I think the economy or the whole money system itself is a distribution system. Yeah. So then it's a distribution system, if you look at it, that's based on scarcity. Right. Because if things aren't scarce, then they're not worth a nickel. You right. know, you can't sell air. Uh, but you can, uh, you know, you have to make something unique to sell it or to, to make it work in our in that particular distribution system. So things that you want to be distributed, uh, uh, what's the word, totally to everybody with nobody left out, it won't work. Uh, because uh, if it's based on scarcity, uh, some people can't have it. So healthcare won't distribute uh, with the money system. Food, right. food for everybody won't distribute with the money system. Uh, information uh, for everybody won't distribute with the money system. 
uh, and even internet information is free, so it's not really distributed uh, with a money system. You've got to have broadband and stuff like that, but in the meantime, right. uh, Never Not Here is free, so then I want to distribute that as wide as possible, you know. And, and So then these things, uh, you know, if something is scarce, then it can be distributed with the economy, and, and, and it supports those people that uh, that made it, you know, and then... That's why medicines, uh, the only medicines that are in the pharmaceutical companies are, are patentable. You know, well, any, so ca any let's kind of health. Tell, go ahead. Let's take an example. Uh, the, the medicines distributable, right? Okay. If we would use our loving community, our oneness community, and go into these economical systems and use it uh, life, in a life supporting way. We would still be engaged in some aspects of it that um, limit our, our capability to move with it. So we would want to transform it as we go. But it doesn't mean that we can't do anything, right? Yeah, now. okay, we'd have to transform it as we go. Because it just, uh, you right. know, it just means that, okay, like there's a lot of rules, you know, like there's something called the FDA that has to approve medicines. And right. it costs millions of dollars to do that. So nobody's going to uh, take wheatgrass through uh, the approval process. Right. And so it's never going to be a remedy. It's just going to be kind of like, a, you know, I'm just saying wheatgrass, like as if it was a remedy. But, you know, any kind of herb, for instance. But see, They're so all here's, free. Here's so nobody's going to invest in that. The connection ultimately for me needs to go from non-dual awareness to what I would want to call, and this is just one of the playgrounds, what I would want to call uh, something like economic activism. In other words, we can uh, use the power of our numbers if we could finally get out of, of the self-centered space, uh, you know, when it comes to survival. We, we're scared. We, we, we don't even bring the conversation to each other. I have hardly ever found, and I've looked far and wide, Ken Wilber, you know, Beyond the Awakening, Andrew Cohen. I mean, it doesn't matter what community I'm listening to that talks about enlightenment and awareness and all that. The theme of economy is never touched on. Never. As if, magically, we're outside of that. I don't get it. I don't understand that. I believe it's not touched because... It's the elephant in the room because in the moment we open that can of worm, the emotions that are behind it are, are so powerful and so big. And our sense of, of, uh, of victimhood, that we live inside of a system that we're dependent on, and that we have to use sort of like, oh, you know, I've got to build a church so I can charge money and don't pay taxes for it, and that, then my sangha works. But if a Sangha is really engaged with each other, you know, we got people. How about connecting Sanghas to each other and, and go into the economy and do something? We can create all kinds of businesses. We can move with this economy in whatever way. That's what I was saying in the beginning. Whatever way we want. The, the economy itself is not the block for that. It is our consciousness our unwillingness to engage in a conversation, because here's what I hear in the moment that comes up. Oh, that's just the mind speaking. Right? This is not the heart. Well, the last time I checked, there's a lot of heartbreaking uh, things happening in the economies. There's a lot of people hungry. There's a lot of people struggling. And even the people who go to those seminars struggle to get to those seminars with their last little penny. Because why? Because they want to get some relief from the struggle they have in their life. And many times that is economically related. So where does it all come into? That's my question. Right? Because, I mean, this. Let's let it make me uh, personal for me. I have a hard time functioning in this world in the sense of, you know, find a job and just do my job and make the money. And then on the weekend, either my store activities or I go to movies or whatever, uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. So I apply in my free time, I apply non-dual consciousness to my, to my life. And then while I'm working, I don't ask questions. I read you. I totally read you.
Mastro Conference and so on and so, and so forth, right? You know, uh, Craig Hamilton, uh, Terry Patton, uh, you know, lately huge interview series, very helpful, beautiful stuff, amazing stuff, you know. Uh, I'm very, in particular, Terry Patton with Beyond Awakening, I really liked where he was going because he's asking that question. Now the first guys are starting to show up saying, what do we do? We can't sit on our asses while the world is going to shit and just talk about enlightenment. That's not good enough anymore, All right? But yet in the next breath, he's offering a course. And in some way, the whole thing is for that purpose. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Not at all. But I, I want to acknowledge that Terry has to make the money for his life in this monetary system. And he is using a very, very good strategy that others have used before to give away a ton of stuff for free. And then in between, drop in his, his pitches about the programs that he sells. <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, you're not doing that. Yeah, I'm not doing that. People have asked me, you know, to get involved in commercially this way or that way, but, you know, I'm not against it in principle in one way, but I, I don't want to give my personal energy to it. And right. in a way, I'm just doing an experiment to see what happens and how, you know, I'm real, you know, it's not like I'm deluded or anything that I realize that we live in uh, self-centeredness and that, right. uh, you know, 99% of people that are watching, uh, you guys, <laughs> <laughs> are just thinking of me, you know? And yeah. is this show, is this the way this guy talks any good for me, you know? And uh, they're not really thinking of how to get Never Not Here out to more people or to share it more or to use, a, uh, make their own kind of vehicle and uh, try to, or even just to share with their neighbor. They're not really thinking of that. I think of it a lot because, uh, you know, I'm always practicing and saying, well, would it, couldn't this just be said to more people in an easy way? So I'm sharing with everybody, basically. And that's, that, that is amazing, Richard. I mean, uh, the place you're coming from, the reason why you do the things you do, and then uh, in connection with, with your uh, economical life in, in, in this universe, so you're giving. Yeah, really. I, I make no money whatsoever out of this place. I mean, if somebody gives me $100 in a month, that's a lot. Right. You know, and uh, it's just my life is just, uh, it's so easy for me to just uh, Skype up to you and say, Daniel, hi, right. <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> and I love to do it. So then uh, that's my own addictions, you know, and I never thought that this would be something that someone should pay for. Yeah. You know? Why? And that's a, a, totally against it. And so then if there ever is a new economic system, I would be on the forefront of kind of helping develop it because I'm not really all tied into the necessities of the old economic system. You said you believe that uh, nobody should be paying for this. Uh, no matter if I agree or not agree with that, um, what would be wrong? with paying for it or what would be um you know um uh, i have a hard time asking the question because i don't want to sound like um uh, you know uh, like a um go for it stereotype but you see in 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 the quote unquote a little bit more enlightened or, or self-aware community money is a very very complicated topic and and why is it such a complicated topic is because we we want to exchange things that are very tender and very very um, um, very close to our heart very very close to what we into what we love uh, what is really really important to us and yet at the same time exactly that community is one of the communities that struggles very much so. Many people around me, beautiful people who have big hearts who would contribute to this new economy, would contribute on all kinds of levels, and they do. They're limited in their contribution because they got to run to their jobs. I believe that we have an uprising of the immune system of humanity. Paul Hawken writes about that in Blessed Unrest. We have an uprising happening all over the planet uh, that 
that simply says this doesn't work anymore. What we're doing is destroying our environment, destroying our social systems. Um, it's it, it doesn't make us any happier. It, it's just not working. This continuous economic growth is just not working. So, and they're ready. They're they're willing to contribute to a different world. And what is holding them back? The very system that they try to up, uh, rise up against. Well, you know, in a way, it's holding them back. But nobody's really coming up with a new. Uh, a paradigm, a new paradigm, or like, I mean, how would it work, or what would I contribute to, or how would we, you and I get together, what are we going to do, you know, right. and how is it going to work? Okay, I've got a vehicle, never not here, that distributes kind of like information and connection, and, mm -hmm. and felt sense connection somehow, right. and yeah, even I can't really, uh, or I haven't given it enough time or uh, to really let it come to how would that be uh, some kind of a seed, uh, to build something around, you know, I, I said even a couple of years ago, let's make a foundation, let's put four or five guys together, let's put this thing out there, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know whether that would, and then let's ask for financing in different places, let's find someone that knows how to write grants, or, you know, like these are old paradigms, but anyhow, they're, they at least work, you know, mm. and then, I mean, people can, and if there was a, if there was a wagon to throw some dollars into, if there was a reason, like a campaign fund or something, there's some kind of a format or somehow there has to be some kind of a way that it would all gel together. You can't just have it in air, you know, and just say, send money and we'll figure out what to do with it. I mean, we could say that too, but I mean, somehow uh, money is what we're working with these days or people's time and, you know, if we're local and right. we can work together. Or, you know, we don't even have to be local because uh, I've done a lot of things on the Internet. I built the whole website with a guy in Sweden, and uh, I never, I've never, never seen him. But we are, right. we're friends for a couple of years. Right, right, right. Well, let's do this then. Um, I, um, because this goes uh, uh, into, into a deeper conversation, I would guess. You know, there's, there's more to it, at least from my side. Um, but we've been at this for a while. Um, for me, uh, there's a very good term um, that I got from Elizabeth Satoris, the, the, biology, uh, the biology professor, and uh, she was interviewed on WIE. And she calls it um, uh, enlightened self-interest. So that we, uh, we need to solve the individual problems that people experience inside of a bigger picture so that everybody uh, gets what they need and then be able to contribute to a bigger picture. You know, it's sort of like fractal economics, you know. Plant a seed, let the seed be three seeds, be that nine seed, and so on and so forth. You know, really sort of plant an economic love virus of some kind. That's how I see it, because... Um, you know, the whole thing with with charity, the charitable model or the non-profit model, so it's dependent on the for-profit model to work, right? I mean, it's, like, it's a hopeless game. If you if you try to get, mon you know, money from over here into this in order to do that, it, it's just, it doesn't seem to work, you know? In one way it can work, you know, because we all have a certain surplus, and so we like to do what we like to do. But I just say that there's no real form of it. You know, it hasn't taken form yet, and so then it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to uh, there has to be like even a snowflake needs a, like a tiny little piece of speck of dust to to form around. Somehow right. we have to have that speck of dust that the snowflake right. can form around. You know, the crystals have to hook onto something to start. Right. And we don't exactly. have that. We don't have that seed crystal. Right, we, and, we don't. Know. Well, I've been, I've been working for a while on uh, on something, but uh, you know, I don't I don't know if this is the the place to share that. Uh, let Let me just say this: I believe we're moving towards something where we use that crystallizing. You know, uh, I like that image very much. I've used it many times. So, you know, in in chemistry, we we did this thing like you dissolve some substance in water, right, you know, and it, 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 and then you heat it up and you dissolve some more, and dissolve some more yeah. until you just can't dissolve anything. And nothing happens, that liquid stays there. 
but then you put something into that liquid and whoop, the crystal starts growing. Yeah, that's a super saturated state, you know, but it right. just doesn't know to make a crystal yet. But the, you put right. just one little tiny thing in there and it might just go bonk. Oh, <laughs> It'd yeah. be a solid block of ice, you know, right. bonk. <laughs> and I think we're in the saturation phase. I mean, there's an increasing number of people just naturally saying, this can't go on. We, we just, and not, not in the sense of, oh my God, everything is so bad. It's just really seeing that the systems and how they're set up are not life supporting. You know, we could do it the other way around and then we would be life supporting. But what we're doing right now, like you pointed out, you know, scarcity, economy of scarcity, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the international monetary system, the fract fractional banking system, uh, you know, the whole thing with derivatives. I mean, this whole, you know, all that you know, together. a great, a great it's key word that they're using now, and that's a word that nobody knows what it means. It's just we're inventing that word, and it's called sustainability. Right. And somehow it means like everything that humanity touches gets be is better when we leave it than when we got to it. In right. some sense, it's more whole when we right. leave it. We're not depleting it. And so then whatever that sustainability is, that should be in our economic uh, talks too. Exactly. So anyhow... I don't know, Daniel. I think we've got a, a long way to go together. I think we've got we can uh, do some brainstorming together and kind of like talk about what would this uh, super saturated state look like. And even if it's only saturated now and it's not quite yet super saturated, that we try to uh, see uh, maybe make a little model. We're creating a restaurant that's a call. It's called um, pay as you want. In other words people who have a little bit more give a little bit more so that we can feed some people that have a little bit less. And uh, we, we employ people that right now experience homelessness and, you know, create uh, not a hand down, but actually to create flow systems. Here we are again, flow systems, engaged system where people are engaging with each other and don't look at each other in a labeled kind of way. You are homeless and I'm privileged and so, Daniel, uh, I really, really have to thank you because, I mean, uh, we've talked about so many things. And, and it looks like that we're, we're, we're kind of building a structure. We, we actually have the potentiality to build a structure uh, uh, for the coming century or uh, somehow uh, build a structure for now, let's call it. What's important is that the spiritual insight in wholeness uh, this, this, this whole realization of interconnectedness, oneness, non-dualism and all that, um, that there is a voice in there and, and, and a trajectory, and a movement uh, that, that I feel in me pushing, you know, from the inside that wants to see it manifested. And that doesn't mean that that's just that action. It's all on all levels. It's sort of a, a holistic activism. And form of activism that happens when I close my eyes and I meditate and I go inside, so-called inside, as well as going outside and do things in, in, in an economic marketplace that um, help more people to be financially free. It doesn't matter what, where it manifests and how it manifests, but I feel like it wants to manifest, it wants to get real. And, uh, you know, like I said before, I think the, the elephant in the room is economics. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, and hunger connected to that hunger. How do we deal with money, with hunger, with poverty in the world, and and our incredible privilege? You know that even the spiritual conversations that are happening in Europe, in in, in North America, uh, you know, can only take place for many of these people while they're eating food that other people grow that don't live very well. So it's like we got to open up our eyes and really understand also our history, our uh, the implications of how we live, of how big that really is, and to realize it's not a danger, it's not something all, um, you know, it's too overwhelming, I can't handle this, it's too much for me. You'll be surprised, that shadow that we carry in our communities, in our collective, um, when we're willing to look at it, it unleashes a lot of energy that we then can use for that transformation. So, thank you, Richard, for for this amazing conversation we went all over the place and for for never not here um, um you know i hope we have uh, uh, many more and we we actually find some way to do something together 
I'm sure we will, and I thank you. And I loved what you just said. You know that dream, that 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 whole dream that comes out of uh, non-duality, spirituality, uh, knowing ourself. Uh, that whole dream wants to be real. It wants to become real, and so let's let's let it. Let's let's, let, let's facilitate yeah. it, and let's let it be real. Thank yeah. You. Thank you very much. Okay, Richard. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Bye bye.